Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the BIS. Happy New Year. Uh, this is our first uh, lecture of 2025, so welcome along. Also, welcome to all our uh, viewers and listeners online. Thanks for joining. So without further ado, I will uh, introduce our speaker, or rather I'll introduce Alistair, who's going to introduce our speaker. So uh, over to you, Alistair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I hope you're all online now and you're all uh, logged in. I had probably with myself, but uh, as uh, Colin has said, welcome to 2025, and this is our first talk. And uh, I, it's great to see so many people here tonight because I hadn't expected to see so many, and we've got a lot more online. So it'll be um, interesting to see what, what part of the world you're in. Um, I think... Uh, I'm pleased to say that we have many more joining us online at the moment, so we're hoping that we'll see them from all over the world. And our camera and Zoom system are in the capable hands of our CEO, Simon Feast, so he's going to take uh, credit for all the, uh, the way things go tonight. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Alistair Scott. I'm chair of the events committee, so I'm always looking for new ideas for events and also for uh, interesting talks, so please get in touch with me. If you've never visited us in Vauxhall, please do so. The building is a, a bit of a treasure trove for space history with comprehensive space library and an amazing collection of 1930s to 50s original artworks and archives that go right back to the start of the space age. Call us a few days ahead of your visit to check that someone is here to show you around. Those joining on Zoom tonight, please use the chat box for your networking and for your questions. And so that we can identify your questions, please put the word question or queue in front of your question. Uh, tonight, we're extremely fortunate in having as our speaker, Mark Hempsall. Mark is a past president of the British Interplanetary Society and a former editor of the Society's journal, JBIS. He has a BSc in physics and an MSc in astro astronomy and astronautics. He has 45 years, really? Yes, it is, wow, uh, of experience as a systems engineer in the space industry working for BAE Space Systems, the University of Bristol and Reaction Engines, and now runs his own consultancy, H H Hempsall Astronautics. He's published around 120 papers and articles on astronautics and currently runs a YouTube channel looking at the impact of films on our cultural perception of space. I assume you're going to advertise that later, are you? No, probably not. Uh, right, well, tonight he's going to tell us all about Helios, which is his program for getting us back into space. Over to you. The subject this evening is a look at what Europe can do in the post-ISS world to uh, further its goals in human spaceflight, and specifically human spaceflight. Okay, credit where it's due. I'm being supported in this study by Bob Parkinson and Richard Osborne. Um, Bob in particular needs some credit for uh, the core vehicle, uh, which is sort of 80% him, although the 20% I've added means he doesn't recognize it anymore. Uh, and of course, all the costings come from Bob, because if you've got Bob, who else would you use? So let's start with fundamentals to see what we're coming on, where we're going to. Um, why do we do space? Why are we likely, as, a, as governments, why do they invest in space? And there's the four obvious things that we all know. Uh, prestige, science, military, and commercial. Most of them make a, a pretty obvious what they mean. Prestige is the funny one because although when we think of it, we think of flags and footprints and being on top and showing how much better we are than everybody else. That it, it's more subtle than that. Different nations have different objectives, which are soft objectives to project the country both internally and externally in the way they wish. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're trying to show they're the best or the biggest. They might just be trying to show that they have an industry or that they are trying to cooperate with other people. And we're going to see that a little later on, that when prestige comes up, it means different things to different nations. So bear those in mind. So I'll be asking questions later on that. Um, how do we do it? 
this applies to robotic spacecraft, but even more is an issue with human spaceflight because the entry cost is big because you can't do it small. So as a nation, you can decide, am I going to do it as a minion? That is, I tag along with somebody else's program and essentially piggyback ride on what they're doing. Do I partner with an equal to create a joint infrastructure that we share, or do I do it all by myself? Now, the point here being, if you're a minion, you do not have control about the use of the facility. The major partner can always say, I'm vetoing that, I make the rules for this system. With a partnership, you have to negotiate rules, but at least you've got a chance of getting what you want to a degree. And of course, if you're autonomous, then that's it. You make the rules and you can do anything you want. So what do we do as Europe? Just to get it out of the way, we'll come back to it right at the end. But outside of low Earth orbit, that decision's already been made. We're going to be going with the Artemis program led by the USA. And Europe is going to be minions because it's worked on Space Lab and the shuttle. It's worked on the ISS. And we're continuing to assume that it's going to work on Artemis. So Europe, and this includes Britain, has already signed up and decided this is how we're going to do our human space flight um, and the next step beyond LEO. But when you look at the situation in LEO, when the ISS is decommissioned, it's starting to get a little bit more uh, complicated. NASA's decided that having successfully got the cargo delivery and the crew delivery in what they call commercial, and we've got to be a bit careful here, it doesn't mean that there's somebody who's got that service and they're offering it. NASA still pays a lot of the development money, and it's basically the, the Yankee customer, if not the only customer, but it means that the services that are being offered are not directly under their control, though it's a commercial mm -hmm. contract. So... We've got at least three space stations, and there may be more, and NASA will be purchasing its astronaut time from these space stations um, to, uh, to achieve its goals. And you say, well, okay, that's easy for Europe. What Europe now does is it buys crew delivery services for its astronauts, and it buys space on the space stations to, uh, to, to, set, to meet its needs. Except two problems. The first problem is that Europe has an indigenous capacity to make human spaceflight systems. And if we just buy American stuff when we want it, A, we lose that uh, capability. It's not exercising that capability. And also, it starts to look as if we actually have to pay dollars, remembering at the moment, no money is exchanged between Europe and America in the ISS status or the Artemis system. Even bigger problem is that everything is American, which means the laws licenses are American. It means the laws that govern its use are Americans. And it means that America can veto anything that it does not like. Um, and in fact, this is a worse situation for Europe than in with the ISS, where we've got a government-to-government -government agreement, and we know the rules because they're all down in this government-to-government -government agreement. This is just open season. At, at the drop of our hat, America could just say, no, we, we, we don't want that. There's no agreement uh, about the use of these commercial facilities on an international basis. So the question then becomes for Europe, do we continue as a US minion or do we try and create some level of autonomous capability? Um, doesn't necessarily mean completely autonomous. It could mean that you get an autonomous capability to the point where you can negotiate partnership status. Um, and that's the route I'm going to sort of say, bear in mind for the moment. So um, with, which route works depends on what you think your overall government objective is. And here's the problem, and it's, it, it's only really hit me hard in the last few years, although it's been with me all my working life, is that different nations have different requirements. There isn't a European 
goal in human space flight. There's a French goal, there's a German goal, there's an Italian goal, there's a British goal, there's a Dutch goal. There's a... Every nation has its own uh, goals. And more important to realise is that ESA does not determine which infrastructure systems gets developed. ESA does not propose infrastructure systems. What it does is it gets proposals from these nations. And when a nation proposes something, and this has been the history of it ever since it started, the nation gets this absolutely brilliant thing. It turns up to the ESA ministerial and says, this. And everybody else goes, what? Because that meets their goals really well, but it doesn't meet the other nation goals. And everybody else says, what the point of that is? Um, often the Brits are saying, well, what's the point of that? Because you've not even touched our goals. If you look at Germany and Italy, they, they're actually a little different, but for simplicity, I'm going to push them together. They've got a combination of prestige and science. And in this case, prestige means they are going to be at the forefront of human space flight, but they're quite happy to do that as a minion. So where, if there's going to be people on the moon, there will be Italians, there will be Germans, um, but it will be done as a minion on other systems. That doesn't matter to them. They're showing that they are uh, at the forefront. And it's actually better for them to be part of an international program because what they're doing is showing the world we are people that you can deal with on an international level. Look how well we work with you on our space program. So their outside perception of prestige is we are a good nation that works with other nations. With the best friend in the world, you can't say that about France. The French are prestige military. Remember, Kness is reports through their military arm. It's, 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 it's effectively uh, a sort of sub-branch of the military. And in their case, prestige means showing that France, sorry, I mean Europe, has the same technical capability, particularly as the USA. So whatever the USA can do, France, sorry, Europe can also do, but it doesn't have to be with the same capability. It doesn't have to be economic. It just has to be the same thing. An example, America has a space shuttle, a winged space plane. France, sorry, Europe has to have a winged space plane called Hermes, um, and you can see it elsewhere in the system that when, when it really comes to the crunch, the Americans have got something, we'll have France, sorry, Europe will have the same thing, even if all it is doing is showing that the basic technologies are there. Okay, so those three are the big nations. Let's go to the fourth, which is Britain. And the first myth to, to, to puncture is Britain does get involved in human spaceflight. The only programs that we've stayed out of are Hermes, which was probably a good idea, and we weren't involved in the ATV. Otherwise, we're there. We may be there in a very small um, place for reasons that we have come up obvious because they're not meeting our objectives, but we are there. On the Space Lab program, we did the Pallet, which was launched on one in five space, lab, uh, space shuttle flights. So it was actually a very important part of the shuttle overall system. Um, on the ISS, there were three systems that were going to come out of Columbus. There was the Mantei de Free Flyer, which the Germans wanted. There was the attached laboratory, which the Italian wanted. And in those two, you can see there's a subtle difference about how being involved is perceived between France, between, sorry, uh, Italy and Germany. And then there was the Columbus space platform for Britain, which was proposed by Bob Parkinson, but it wasn't like he invented something that NASA hadn't already thought of. NASA had laid out what it thought the space station infrastructure should be. The space platform was in that NASA infrastructure. We were just saying it would be a good thing for Europe to do. Um, and it, it clicked a bit because it actually looked like it could meet some of Britain's needs. Now, as the space station program evolved, and an understanding of what Britain wanted from it evolved, it ended up as MBSAT. And everybody forgot that MBSAT was us buying our way into the space station infrastructure. 